So good morning beautiful people. So I'm sat outside Starbucks just picking up my road coffee for my trip up to Avebury and I'm super excited to share this beautiful beautiful site with you. This is a huge complex, um, the biggest one in the UK and uh, it is a, a stone structure that is absolutely magnificent. So I can't wait to share more information with you today to take you to all the special sh places around there and just to show you exactly what's going on there and um, yeah I hope you enjoy um, the videos that we're putting together today so yeah let's go right so we're going to start today by first going through some information about the site just to paint the picture for you and then I am literally going to take you on a bit of a walking tour of the site and um, share more details about the different sections of the site okay so um, this is literally the biggest stone circle in the world it's got a diameter of 427 meters, but there's so much more to this beautiful Neolithic serpent temple than, than you can see today and then what's left. And um, so I'm going to share some information with you just about like the layout of it and how it was actually like hundreds of years ago and what it actually looked like. And this is all thanks to a guy called William Stuckley. Okay, so in the 1700s, he was a young doctor from Lincolnshire and he heard about this place and then decided to come and explore it for himself and absolutely fell in love and became a little bit obsessed and kept coming back and kept coming back. And lucky for us, he actually took time to do some drawings of the site of what it looked like at that point in time and was able to actually give us a like a really clear indication of what the site was all about. So I'm going to share a picture with you that he created in the 1700s, and this will give you a really good idea of what the site looks like. So we're going to start from the center of the picture. So when you look at the center of the picture, you will see that there is um, a massive round circle, and this is the center of the serpent. So within this round circle, there is two other smaller circles, and that is our sun circle and our moon circle. So I'll go into a bit more detail when we go and visit those sections. So I'll tell you a bit more about how they laid out. Um, so it's basically multiple stone circles within one absolutely huge stone circle. Okay, so there is estimated, now if you look at the entire picture, to be between 600 and 800 stones that was like involved in this whole construction. It's got a head and it's got a tail, okay? And the head is basically what we call the sanctuary. So that was a smaller stone circle that had like stones that were about 1.5 meters tall, was much smaller, but a very powerful and energetic um like section of land um and it's towards the marlborough side so if you ever look on a map and you decide to go there go and look for the sanctuary there's little wooden poles there there's no, nothing left there all the stones have been taken by the farmers and it's all been destroyed um and so basically what happens is this this then from that section there you'll see that there's like an entire avenue of stones that then runs into the big circle and then that then again there's another avenue of stones that becomes the tail and that goes to Beckhampton and then that ends over there. Okay. Now you might ask yourself the question, why is the site laid out like this? What is this all about? Now, lucky for us, again, there's been some brilliant people in history. There were two guys who um, started looking at the Michael Ley line. So you would have heard me speak about Hamish Miller and um, Paul Broadhurst before. And um, the two of them, as they then moved up the Michael Ley line, obviously came to Avebury and then started dowsing the energy lines. Okay, so last time when we um, went to Glastonbury, you will remember that I spoke about the dragon line. So we have the, the Michael and the Mary current. Um, that runs and what happened was that they they basically discovered the dragon lines here and realized that there were two lines of energy that ran through the site and this was how they, they literally ended up coming from this space and like having to retrace their steps back because they realized that there were two energy lines okay and they discovered both of these energy lines running through this site here they they cross over within the site. So what you will see here on the next picture that I'm going to share is you will see the Mary and the Michael 
dragon currents as they run okay so they cross over here um right by the obelisk which i will speak about in the sun circle a little bit more and then the michael line runs exactly with the west kennet avenue so this little tail that you see here um all the way from the sanctuary that is literally the michael energy running all the way down into avebury and then the next line the next pathway that runs out at the bottom to beckhampton that is then an extension of the michael energy running out okay so it's fascinating how this whole complex was literally built on these lines and how these guys actually discovered it and then realized that these two energy lines were basically supporting this St. Michael's ley line that they had decided to investigate. Now you'll see here that the Mary line also runs through the sanctuary. So that's the smaller place. I'm just going to share a picture here of what it currently looks like today. Okay, so here at the sanctuary, we have the Mary and the Michael line crossing, and then Mary goes all the way through West Kennet Long Barrow, which I will be posting another video about later on in the month, um, which is a super powerful spot, and that then goes through Silbury Hill, and then when we go through Silbury Hill, that then ends up here in Avebury at the obelisk, where she then meets the, the, uh, the Michael line. Okay, and then she go makes her way out all the way to Windmill Hill as well, okay, where they cross again. So they keep on like going over and over and over each other, and it's really, really awesome. Okay, so I want you to have a look at this next picture. So this is a um, basically a reconstruction or depiction of what the site looked like, and this gives you a really good idea um, of the circle and how it was all put together. Okay, so there's this ditch around. So you'll see if you look at the picture, there's a massive um, like white circle outside of where the stones are. So there's a hundred stones in this massive big circle on the outside. And then there's the ditch. Um, and that ditch was 3.7 meters deep and nine meters high. Okay, almost nine meters high. And that ditch was absolutely pristine white. You'll see, I'll take you into the, um, with the remains of the ditch a bit later in the video. But this was basically covered in chalk. So 200,000 tons of white chalk around the side here. And this would have been this huge, beautiful, like reflective surface that you would have come across as you crossed the hills. And you would have seen this massive white circle in the middle of this landscape, which is so impressive. Now you can also see that there's like four entrances to the site and then you can see on this picture where the West Kennet at the bottom of the picture that's now where the West Kennet Avenue comes in so that's where the Michael Ley line also runs through. And then you basically came into the site and then it had the two stone circles in there. Now the estimate for the site is that it's around 6000 years um, old. And um, then there's also like, basically it took people like, you know, if you, like over a thousand years to construct this. And by 3000 BC, they raised the obelisk and the cove stone. So those are the big stones that I'm going to be speaking about later. Okay, so this was a thriving site um, from about... Um, 4000 BC up until about 1000 BC um, because the temperature was really amazing okay so you had this like sub um, boreal climate where things were like really good people could plant the farmers were there they did their thing and then it started to change to a sub-atlantic um, like weather climate okay and basically what happened then it was like a lot more rain mostly what we're experiencing now in England. So um, high winds, really cold, all of that. So it made farming and all of that a lot harder for people and they needed to migrate and therefore they abandoned the site. Okay, so the circle was abandoned, the site was abandoned and that's when things really started to change. Around the 12th century, um, there was a priory that was built there. So where the Avebury Manor stands now, there was a Benedictine priory there. Um, and the church basically started to 
speak about like the stones and the significance of the stones and they were trying to ask this whole like pagan connection so this is where people started toppling the stones this is where people started burying the stones um which is really sad because they basically dismantled this massive structure okay there's something like 76 stones that's left over now um and luckily for us, um, the guy who restored the site, which I'll speak a little bit about later, he found a lot of these stones and put them back together and like, like basically we erected them and put them up again for us to see today in its proper format. Okay, um, they also found the massive obelisk that I speak about later. Um, and they broke it up for building stones and um, they even found when they were basically um, taking these stones up again like when they were like resurrecting the stones they found um like a body under there as well and they believe that at that point in time this person that was obviously crushed by the stone um the people actually stopped then felling the stones and like <laughs> taking the stones down because they took this as a bad omen um so lucky for us they kept some of the stones up and this actually kept the site intact um, until they obviously in the 1700s when the farmers came along and they started realizing how they could use the stone more and they then took a lot of the other stones that was part of the the avenues and all of that that I showed you earlier on um, so all of that was destroyed then as well but lucky for us everything was kind of <laughs> saved by this fantastic guy called Andrew Kyler and we're going to speak about him a little bit later in the video as well okay so Let's head on over and start our trip up the West Kennet Avenue, which I've showed you on the picture before, is literally coming from the sanctuary into the stone circle. Right, so this is the way into Avebury. So this is the West Kennet Avenue. As you can see behind me, all those beautiful stones. So this avenue runs all the way from the sanctuary and then this goes all the way into the Avebury Circle. We go through the big entrance and then all the way to the obelisk and then out the other side. And you also see the row of stones. So there's stones on each side of um, this avenue. And basically what is really clever about this, when the professional dowsers came and found the Michael Dragon line over here, and this entire avenue is basically the Michael Dragon line. Um, it's very interesting that the line runs in between the stones. So the stones literally track the line of the Michael Dragon line. Okay, and that dragon line runs all the way to the sanctuary, which is the beginning of the whole serpent temple. And so I'm just going to give you a little view to see how that looks. So you can see there, and then just to give you an indication, you can probably hear the crystal bowl there as well. Someone's busy playing a beautiful crystal bowl. Okay. Okay, so walking down the avenue now, in between the two stones. on the beautiful Michael Dragon Line. That's quite interesting to walk around here because <laughs> um, the mixture of the Mary and Michael Dragon Lines can get quite interesting and quite freaky. So something to look out for. So you'll just see all of the markers running down all the way right down to the big tree at the bottom there and then that's where we enter the stone circle so you'll see those massive mounds so now they're about three meters high they would have been up to nine meters high but because of the erosion that's happened and they've been broken down quite a bit um, but they would have been white as well so as I said before, like a chalk white, huge, huge thing. 
in the middle of this landscape. So just another thing to bear in mind when you think about stone circles is that a lot of the stone circles are basically points where water come together. So the ancients would have used the energy of the water to basically plot a landscape and then create a circle. Now, when water underneath the earth comes together, um, it's what they call new water. They create like a spiral effect, like a spiral energetic effect. And this is obviously a very huge point just because of the sheer size of this place. Um, so energetically, this is how they would have doused these circles. Now often also what happens is that there is um, fault lines. And fault lines obviously opens up the energy field as well. Um, and they have found fault lines under Avebury as well. So energetically this place is pretty damn potent. Okay, so we're getting closer now. You'll see this beautiful stone here indicating the way towards the circle. You would have gone through these two points on the road where the cars go through now between the two banks and then right up to the big entry stones, which we'll go and have a look at right now. Okay, so this would have been the entrance into the stone circle. So if you look to the left, you can see across the road, the stones over there. And then to that side, you'll see that there's no stones left. So they would have buried and broken up most of the stones over that side. Over here is the devil's chair. I'm going to take you around just now, but just to give you an indication, this is a 60 ton stone. It is 4.3 meters wide and almost 4 meters tall. And you'll see the little seat right in there. I'll try and get you a shot of me in the seat <laughs> so we can just have a look at that okay so the devil's chair literally if you sit in that seat now before there wouldn't have been trees over here so you would have been able to look all the way down West Kennet Avenue and the priestesses or the priest who would have sat here in this chair would basically have been able to see the winter sunrise well middle midwinter sunrise and sunset okay <laughs> there you go <laughs> love it <laughs> Just to give you some orientation, so I'm looking at the entrance right now. You see the big trees there, the other stone circle where the sun circle is, and then here are some more of the remaining standing stones. So we just have to kind of go into the sun there a bit, just excuse the glare. Just want to give you a good indication of how that finishes up on this side. Okay, as you can see, it's quite windy today again. <laughs> okay. So, I'm currently stood inside the middle of the, um, the sun circle. So, as I explained before, we have the big outer ring of about 100 stones, and then we have the two, the cove, and then this one. Okay, so this one, um, you can see the little monument behind me. That's where the obelisk would have been. So, that was a 6.4 meter high obelisk of stone. It was erected right here and this is one of the first things that basically went up in the circle um how many feet i think it's about 21 feet and okay so that goes all the way up and then around that you will see some smaller circles so i'm just going to show you the layout now and just explain why this part of the circle is so important 
Okay, so you can see now that there is the placement of the obelisk. Next to it is the smaller stone circle that would have gone around it. And then outside that you'll see the bigger stones. Okay, they're quite huge. And there was about 30 of those massive, massive stones around here. Now this point here where the obelisk is, is literally where the dragon lines, so the Michael and the Mary dragon lines cross at that particular point. So the ancients with their huge obelisk was really quite clever because they took the most powerful point in the entire area and they placed it upon there. Okay. And so if you do come here, it can take a few minutes to go and sit there. Um, it's quite an interesting little experience. Now, one of the things when I came here the very first time, I didn't really know much about this place. So I really just followed my intuition as I explored the stones and spent some time with them. And these bigger stones, what I saw were these women with their hands upon the stones and basically coming into the circle here to come and give birth okay so now if you have a looky at the stones we'll walk up to them a little bit closer they all have what i would call almost like a personality of their own right so like when i tuned into them they were almost like totem animals they felt like and i would see these women walking to the stones and basically start their birthing process by the stone so whatever totem animal they wanted to give to their children, they'd go to that stone and have their birthing experience right there. Now another big part of what happened here, or what would have happened here, was like, because they celebrated the different times of year, they used the obelisk as a massive sundial, okay? So when they started experimenting and seeing, well, why was this thing so big? They could literally see how the sundial would cast a shadow upon the different stones as the different times of year would happen. So it wasn't just when the equinox and the solstice would happen, but it would do those in between time frames as well. So when we had Beltane and the Mars and Sawain and all of that happening in between, there would be a stone that it fell on as well. Okay, so just imagine living 6,000 years ago, you wouldn't really have had your Google Calendar available and you would have used this to basically indicate when what was happening, okay? And there'd be huge festivals. Now, this was really a big ceremonial spot where there'd be huge festivals held to celebrate going into wintertime, to celebrate summer happening and the harvesting and planting season and all of those type of things and I um, <laughs> I even had visions of beautiful big parties happening here fertility rites being um, experienced etc and um, have all these beautiful crows flying overhead as well and just communities of people basically women all pregnant at the same time coming together to all give birth at the same time as well and it would have been really a beautiful experience right with all of the priestesses that worked at this temple as well and we're gonna go to uh, West Kennet Long Barrow as well and for me that was a priestess initiation site which also indicated for me how this site is very much linked to the priestesses and the work that they did here to hold the community and to ensure that everything that happened here stayed in that beautiful sacred space. So just to give you an indication of how big these stones are, the ones that is on the outside here of the, the sun circle. Don't know if you can see hundreds and hundreds of crows everywhere. You can probably hear them. Okay, so as I said before, these were the stones that all felt like they had a beautiful personality. And you can see all the markers as to where the other stones were, either buried or destroyed.
can also see the scent of the town from here, the little town, and then the church that was built there. And then if you look back, you can see the obelisk. So one of the unique things about Avebury is that it has a town right in the center of a stone circle. So this is literally the only place in the world where you'll see a town and a road go through an existing stone circle. So you've got the pub there, you've got some houses here, there's a parish behind these houses as well, and a major road that runs through here that's quite busy as you can hear from the footage as well, lots of cars passing. But there's an entire little town that's built in the middle of a stone circle. So I'm quite happy I don't <laughs> have to live right in the middle of any stone circle because I reckon it could be quite intense. But I'm pretty sure these guys are used to it by now. So here we have the cove. So this is the moon circle. So as we said before, inside the massive stone circle that had the hundred stones, we had two other smaller stone circles. So the cove, this is the center of the second um, smaller stone circle okay so the massive stone that you see in front of you that is the female stone the feminine stone and then the one to the left here is the male stone now there would have been another stone another male stone but that one was broken down and used for building material okay so they would have stood right in the center so i'm just going to pan now see how beautiful it is today very lucky Okay, you see this massive stone? Okay, now the first two here, the first three, they were erected 3000 BC, about 2800 BC. These ones were erected, so there were 30 of them. They say between 27 and 30. Okay, so you'll see beyond the tree is another one. Okay, so there would have been this huge circle around. And then the archaeologists also found that there was another circle of 12 smaller stones, way smaller stones, but these would have all been used for building material by now, that stood around these guys here, around the three. Okay, now this was a moon circle and they basically um, determined this uh, through the moonrise cycles. Okay, so every 18.6 years, there's a specific moon alignment that happens in this place and there's a big celebration and people come together here to observe it. So I think the last one was in 2006 that I read about. So they do believe that this was obviously used for like monthly moon rituals, but the big one was the 18.6 year moon return or moon rise that they would observe. It basically goes right over the female stone here and then the moon shows herself so this was a very sacred spot for more ritual over here okay so just to show you here uh, many of the stones were buried so lucky for us many of the stones were buried so that really helped the guys when they were doing their restoration work that they could actually see where the stones stood um, so you can see here, these would have been placed underground. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, there was about a hundred stones that went on the outside of here, of this massive henge. I'm going to take you a little bit closer to the ditch and the outside of the henge. So this... Okay, so you'll see that they basically tore down massive chunks of the henge and if you just look down into the ditch here you can see how really deep it is right next to where the stones were so this was the whole outline and then you had the massive massive 
Penge. I don't know if you can see all the beautiful kites in there and hear the birds as well. So we'll just have a walkie here. Love this tree here as well. It's a beautiful ceremony under there. A while back. Okay, so I'm going to take you here. You can just see how the stones were broken down as well. Really freaking sad. And then we have the markers here that indicate where they were. see how these ones basically been completely broken down and then parts of these missing here now I'm gonna again put myself in front of these because they do get a lot bigger. Okay. So this one is known as the Diamond Stone. And you'll see that there's cars crossing, so there's a road that's been made. And this one is known to basically cross the road at night and move from one side to the other. So if you take the little pathway from the Red Lion pub and you walk all the way down, you can just walk a little bit further and we get to the most amazing beach trees. Definitely worth a visit. Okay, so we have one man to thank for all of this being available for us to see today. And his name is Andrew Kyler. Okay, so he was literally the person who excavated and saved the site. So um, he was known as the Marmalade Millionaire. And his family basically in the 1800s started selling marmalade and made an absolute fortune. And so, um, as a young man, he inherited all this money after his dad passed on. And um, he was really interested in archaeology. So, in the 1930s, after having discovered this place, he... Hello! <laughs> How are you? <laughs> go back. Are you not going to go? <laughs> okay, I just had a moment with the doggy there that you would have seen. Anyway, so in the 1930s he purchased um, 950 acres of land over here 
and um, then he basically started first by clearing out like the site um, making sure that all of the uh, henge um, was also cleared out completely and then what he started doing was he started digging up the stones that were lost so as I told you before the church obviously had a bit of a field day um, <laughs> inciting everyone to uh, get rid of these pagan heathen stones and um, so a lot of them were buried in the 1400s so what he then did was he excavated them and the ones that wasn't um, able to be saved um, he placed these beautiful little markers there as a remembrance to how the site used to look so I have a lot of love for this man for doing this work um, because he was like literally him and his team um, were single-handedly responsible for the site being saved now he sold this to the National Trust um, in 1943 but he sold the land to them basically just for what he bought it didn't even charge them for any of the excavation work um, so this man's a bit of a legend in my opinion so just the last few notes on the energies of the site so as I explained in the beginning this is obviously where the Mary and Michael dragon lines run through so there's a real potent energy about the site um, but this this presence of the like the womb energy and this mother energy and being held there um, is really, really prevalent and you feel it so much when you go into the space, the minute you drive into the area, it's just got such an incredible feel to it and you feel immediately at home like the earth is literally inviting you in so. Um, if you will just have a look at the meditation that I recorded um, from connecting with the site and then you can just feel into the energies for yourself as well. But I do find that the site for me is really like one of those beautiful, like coming home to yourself sites. Okay, so it's just it's so worth visiting. If you ever have the opportunity, do make sure that you go there um, because it's absolutely magical. Okay, so you can go and have a look at the meditation that I've recorded for you and then just take an energetic journey into the land here. And thank you so much again for joining me for today's um, video. I hope you enjoyed um, all of the sights and um, even though it was a bit windy in some places, um, it was still, it was great fun to make this video. Um, so please do like and subscribe and all those good stuff that you have to do so that you can get new notifications when I put new videos out. Um, and thank you so much for your support and I hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you, thank you, thank you.